Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to see y'all here. Uh, as you can tell, it's it's been a while, so it's it's glad to be. I'm glad to be back here as well. Um, it hasn't been from a lack of God God speaking. Uh, we've just been really busy, uh, and then there there were some other things that that I'll I'll go into later on in the video uh, that had happened and uh, hopefully somebody will get something good out of it. Uh, I know I did. And uh, everybody I tell the story to, um, they get a little something out of it too. Um, but going back to being busy, you know, you can't ever be too busy for God. It's, we have no problem studying, we, we do all that. Um, and God has given me enough information. I, I actually have uh, two videos in, in store and um, I just kind of been, I kind of been running from it like Jonah. Um, I never, I never like giving people bad, um, um, bad news. Or I, I don't like, I don't like being the Jonah. You know what I mean? I don't, or not Jonah, but I don't like being the Jeremiah. Pa pardon me. Um, you know, whenever the king asked Jeremiah or somebody else Jer asked Jeremiah what was what was going to happen or what he prophesied, you know, he'd always prophesy and he never had anything good to say. And uh, I don't like being that guy. I think God's called me to be that guy. And uh, so the next message after this one um, is going to be that is going to be that uh, that message. It'll be the message of Jeremiah, pretty much. But um, so all this kind of running around like I have of Jonah, you know, it's it's kind of been one thing after another. And, uh, you know, Jonah was, <laughs> Jonah had a whole bunch of stuff happening to him. And finally, he's like, okay, God, I'll, I'll go. So today, I, I sat down and I'm like, God, I, I will do it. Um, but it's been, it's been an exciting, this study has been extremely exciting. Um, I've given this uh, presentation three times <laughs> over the last two weeks. Uh, I gave it at two different Bible studies, and uh, uh, Michelle and I went over it this morning. And uh, I can always, I can always tell when it's going to be a good study when Michelle's crying. So it's, it's kind of good. But uh, <clears throat> that being said, uh, I kind of, kind of told myself, quit being stubborn, quit being stubborn. You know, I've I've went over stuff with um, with uh, Karen and Crystal and Sally and everybody. Um, I've had people check in on me, people like Joe and Cindy and Lynn, Val, everybody. I want to I want to thank you guys for checking on me. I, I really appreciate you, uh, and it means a lot. Uh, so <laughs> finally, it's like today is like you know, or a while about three or four weeks ago. Whenever God had given me this, had given me this message. Um, I was being stubborn, and I could tell. I could tell I was being stubborn, and uh, that that the old saying came back to me: "Stubborn as an old mule." Well, um, I had uh, I had it attributed it to a donkey. I know how stubborn donkeys are, stuff like that. And uh, so we started. Michelle and I started studying um, stories about the ass in um, in scripture you know, all through Scripture, and it actually coincided um, with the ox, or what we know are cows. So the kind of, the study um, just kind of went together and went off in a, in a direction, and so we've just been um, following breadcrumbs. Like I said, I've given this presentation three times in the last two weeks, and all three times it's been something different. Uh, the first one I gave to um, was to people that were educated in the word um, and pretty much knew the ins and the outs and in the second time I gave it I gave it to some uh, <laughs> some babies some baby Christians and then like I said the third time was was this morning to Michelle and, and uh, she she said you need to write this down you need to write this down I was like oh the, the Holy Spirit will remind me so that's where I'm at I'm going to give this over to the Holy Spirit and we'll let him take it wherever he's going to take it because um He's our teacher, you know. There's nothing I, I that I would want to come from my mouth that that isn't preordained by him. I I prayed uh, Isaiah fifty five ten, you know, 
before I started this, you know, uh, Lord, let your message go out. Let it not return unto you void. Let it accomplish that which which you've sent it. So, um, this study I've I've, I've kind of done before. I've I've talked about the donkey or the ass in Luke 19, which um, that's where we'll start out is in Luke 19. But I've talked about it before. Um, I talked about how the the donkey it says was it wasn't weaned. It hadn't been sat on yet. Um, which that makes it, if you study it, donkeys out. Um, that makes it in between four and seven months old. So between four and seven months, a donkey's about the size of a dog. Um, I guess a medium a medium to a medium-sized, large-sized dog. Um, they're not real big. So imagine, you know, Jesus riding into town on something like that. Um and so you just kind of, how does that work? How does that happen? And they, they cast the clothes on him and, and all this. And uh, so it just makes you wonder if it looked like he was floating on a on a carpet, you know. Uh, but anyway, um, he came in meek and lowly. And I asked last week um, to some people that I was doing this study on, I asked them, I said, uh, could this be happening now? Um, could all this be happening now? Jesus riding into town. Um, one thing I like about donkeys, if you study this out, and if you want to pause the video and, and uh, go look at images of donkeys when they're born, um, most every one of them, I've, I've seen some white ones that didn't have this, um, but they are born, they have a cross on their back. So it just kind of reminded me of the pick up, pick up your cross and follow me, and it also reminded me of Jesus riding into town on that on that ass. He rode into. He rode in. He rode in on a cross. And then he stood on the cross. So, there's that. Uh, that's another thing. <laughs> so, oh, I'm sitting here. I've been crying all day. I, you know, I never. I'm, I'm not a crier. I'm really. If you know me, I mean, I'm not. I'm not a crier until I start talking about God. And when I talk about God, it's just the emotions come out. Uh, <laughs> I think it's just from years of not crying. <laughs> I don't know. So, anyway, I'm going to start off here in Luke 19. And we're going to jump around. We're going to talk about oxes or cows and donkeys or asses. They're they're called they're called asses in the Bible. So uh, I don't <laughs> I don't particularly like saying that word, but um, it is what it is on 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 this study. So uh, I'm going to start in Luke 19 and verse 28, and then we'll jump around. You know how I always like to jump around. We'll jump around to a bunch of scriptures. So, uh, Luke 19 and verse 28. This is the triumphal, the triumphal entry, entry into Jerusalem on by Jesus. Okay? It says, And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up into Jerusalem. you got to ascend up into Jerusalem. I'll go over that. And it came to pass, when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. Now, let's stop real quick. You've got Bethlehem, and then you have Bethany, or Bethlehem, and then Bethphage, and then Bethany. Okay, and then you, you come to the Mount of Olives, you're going down the Mount of Olives, you get down into the Kidron Valley, and then you go up into Jerusalem, you look up. And we'll get on to that a little bit later in this chapter. Uh, we're going to jump around in this chapter and go to some others and then come back to it. But um, it's neat here where he talks about um, the two witnesses. Or not two witnesses, two disciples. And so I put the two disciples, two witnesses. What else do we know that are twos in the Bible? Well... We know there's an Old and New Testament. That's two. We know that there 
God sits in between two cherubs, doesn't he? He sits in between the wings. So I've been meditating on this for for days and weeks. And so, if you look at your Bible, here's one wing, and here's another wing. And on every single page, you'll find Jesus. You'll find God if you're looking. If you're one of these people that go to a church and you don't even crack your book, your Bible, because you're busy reading the words up on the screen, and then you go home and you go back out to your car, and the only reason you carry it is to look cool, and you throw this in the back of your car until next Sunday, or if it's just sitting up on your on your shelf somewhere gathering dust, you're not going to have a relationship. You're not going to find Jesus. You're not going to find God because you're not looking between the wings. So, he sent two disciples. I've done videos. Other people, Crystal, uh, Karen, we've done videos about who is prophesying right now. Are there two witnesses prophesying right now in two different spirits? The spirit of Elijah, maybe. What your Bible say about that? If you look, you'll find it. So, could these two disciples be referring also to the two witnesses? I was asking, it's just a question. I was asking the people last week, could this be happening right now and us not see it? Because we're looking physically and not spiritually. Onion. Now, this is great. So before before I had, did this video, I went to get an onion out because we always have onions, and we didn't have an onion. So Michelle says, "There's one in the there's one in the in the uh, refrigerator." So I open it up and it's cut. I said, "Oh no, God! This, this onion's cut in half." <laughs> so I asked God. I said, "Hey, tell me there is something here. Tell me there is something here." And the reason that this is cut and there's not an onion because I always have an onion. And he put it right in my head. You see the layers? There's layers. There's pages. He's in every layer. You gotta search for him. Yes, he will make his self known. All are called, few are chosen. It's because they're not, they're not looking, they're not answering. So, anyway, he sent two of his disciples, saying, "Go ye into the village over against you, in which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never a man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. If any man ask you." Why do ye loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And like I said, I kept asking them last week, or actually it was this past Friday, could this be happening now? And people not see it. If you live in this country, you have owners. If you are addicted, if you are playing with Satan's toys and you have no way out, you have owners, spiritually speaking. Spirits. So, that being said, let's go to Acts 16. In verse 16. Acts 16. Verse 16. I want to re remind you of that. The owners...
16, verse 16. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us. This is Paul and Silas walking through, walking through Philippi. They kept walking around, preaching, teaching, talking to people, healing. A certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gained by soothsaying her owners. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us unto the way of salvation. And this did she many days, following them. We know who you are. We know who you are. Finally. But Paul, being grieved, after a while, he turned and said unto the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out that same hour when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers, brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. They teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. What are we doing? Paul and Silas. What were they? Two witnesses. Two disciples. That's what they were doing. So, we talk about the owners. So they owned her. We know that ox. We're talking about the ox. The ox and the donkey. So there's a scripture that says, Do not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the grain. Why don't they muzzle the ox that treadeth out the grain? They don't muzzle the ox because it's feeding its flesh. It's not feeding its spirit, is it? It's feeding its flesh. It's getting fatter. It's getting whatever it needs to survive. Physically speaking. It's not storing up treasures in heaven where moth and rust doth not corrupt. So, that's what you're seeing now. Everybody that is not God's is treading out the grain for their owners. That being said, so Luke 19 The owners thereof said unto them, Why lose ye the colt? They said, The Lord hath need of him. Could that be happening now? August 28, 2018. I was loosed. Because the Lord had need of me. And so that's why I'm here talking to you now. Because the Lord hath need of me. That's why everybody that you see on YouTube, that's what they're doing. They were loosed. The Lord hath need of them. Even though you don't have a YouTube channel, the Lord hath need of you. He loosed you. Find out what it is that He needs you to do or wants you to do and go and do it. You can love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and spirit and still go to hell. you got to love your neighbor as yourself. That has to go with it. The Bible says if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. My Bible says a murderer will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Anyway, let's get back on track. I want to go to Isaiah 1 and chapter 3.
Isaiah 1 and chapter 3, or Isaiah 1, verse 3, sorry. It says, The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know my people, or doth not know my people doth not consider. It says, The ox knoweth his owner. That woman, she knew her owner, the damsel with the familiar spirit. The ass knows his master. My Bible says, call no man master. So who's the master? Oh, there's another thing that I learned. In Exodus 13, verse... 13 in this study. I'm going to start in 12. Let's go to Exodus 13, verse 12, and I'll read down through 13. Verse 12 says, That thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix. The matrix means womb. Every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast the males shall be the Lord's. Every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou wilt not redeem it, thou shalt break its neck. And all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. What did Jesus, what did he ride into Jerusalem on? He rode in on the ass. When he left Jerusalem, what was he standing on? He was standing on a cross. He was redeeming all those asses. All of us. We were all asses at one time. Let's go to Titus 2.14. And this is a, a witness to confirm Exodus 13.13. 13. says, Who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity he redeemed us. He loosed us. To purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. We follow him. John 10. John 10 says, My sheep hear my voice. They know my voice and they follow me. So in Luke, when the ass was loosed, he followed. I, uh, I'm going to go back to Luke. We read to 34, so I'm going to start in 34 again. And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Verse 39 says, And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And they called him Master, didn't they? I'll tell you a little story. All the lambs that were, were, were supposed to redeem Israel for the next year that were sacrificed at Passover 
all came from Bethlehem. I was telling you before, there was a procession that went from Bethlehem to Bethphage to Bethany. Down the Mount of Olives into the Kidron Valley and then up into Jerusalem. There were supposedly at that time three, three and a half million people in Jerusalem. It was rumored, or not rumored, but uh, the statistics that it shows um, has said that there was most likely 250,000 lambs that were sacrificed during Passover at that time. It is said, if you read, study it out, there was a procession that led all the way from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. Imagine how far that is. Imagine how many people are doing that. The high priest, the high priest is carrying the Peshaw lamb, the Passover lamb, the lamb that will be sacrificed for Israel. Now, every family had their own lamb, but there was one that went for Israel the entire people, nation of Israel. There was one. And the high priest carried it all the way from Bethlehem. And so, at that time, whenever the high priest is holding up the lamb and he's walking down the Mount of Olives, I've said this in here before, you had the great multitude of people. They were casting their palm branches out. It wasn't for Jesus. It was for that Peshaw lamb and the high priest to walk over. They'd done it every year. But Jesus and His disciples sneak in right in the front. And so the Pharisees start yelling at him, get out of the way. Verse 40. Jesus answered and said unto them, I tell you, that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. The reason being is it's been foretold, it was prophesied, it's prophesied in Daniel 9.25, I think. He will confirm a covenant with many. But anyway, it tells you what day he was coming in. He has to fulfill it. So if they wouldn't, if the disciples wouldn't declare him king, the rocks would cry out creation all of creation to cry out because we are too ignorant or stupid or dumb or too smart to understand who he was and who he is and who He will be. We can't fathom it. If we can't see it, we won't believe it. It doesn't matter how many people. The Bible says it doesn't matter if someone comes back from the dead, you will still not believe. People that are waiting for a third temple. These red heifers that came from Texas last year and are already there. They're two years old. They've got to be three. You're going to sit there and watch. And you're going to watch. And you're going to watch. Until you're hung. Or that Venus flytrap, like I've said before. It doesn't go fast. It goes slow. Until you have nowhere to go I've said this before this earth this place it's not going to go out with a bang 
It's going to go out with a whimper. Verse 41. When he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Jesus wept. There's plenty of places where Jesus wept. What is it? The smallest scripture in the Bible, Jesus, I think it's John 11, 35. Jesus wept. It's unbelief. Verse 42, saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this day, this day, you should have known. You should have watched. The things which belong unto thee, thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Why didn't they know? Why didn't they know? The Pharisees in the synagogue. The people that had said, Hey, this ain't right. This ain't the mark. It's not your forehead, is it? Y'all are going to be responsible for killing a lot of people. I want to prove that to you in this scripture coming up. You need to open your Bible. You need to have a relationship with the author. For the day shall come upon thee, and thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, encompass thee round about and keep thee in on every side. The corner in this. They shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. They shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. You should have known. Like I said, if you'd read Daniel 9.25, you'd have known. Verse 45. The cleansing of the temple. I like this. He went into the temple. Jesus began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Jesus comes in there and whips them all. Removes them all. Is that what's fixing to happen now? I believe that's what's fixing to happen now. When he comes back, he ain't going to be on a donkey. He ain't coming meek and mild and lowly. going to have a vesture dipped in blood and on, his, and on his thigh it's going to say King of Kings and Lord of Lords he's going to be riding on a white horse he's going to have his saints behind him he's going to have me behind him he's going to have you behind him like I said before I don't see too many people that would sit through all this 34 minutes already and uh you know, people, TikTok, you know, it's got everybody used to a minute and 40 seconds. So there's not a whole lot of people that would sit through this. But the ones that do are hungry. They want fed. They want fed. I'll give you meat. I'm going to show you feeding here in a minute. I'll give you meat. Zechariah 9.9. Zechariah 9.9 9. If they'd have just looked for that they'd have just looked for that donkey that ass let me ask you a question 
spiritually, layerly, does that ass represent you? Jesus rides inside you, does He not? He's in you. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. He came in on an ass. He loosed it. He has two witnesses loose it. So, that's the story of the donkey. I kind of want to get to the story of the cow. So in this study that Michelle and I have been doing about the donkey, and it's stuff you, you most likely already know, but it's still stuff that needs to be said. Um, in this study in the donkey, we kept running into cows and ox. Um, matter of fact, this, this is how in-depth, I guess you could say, we went. Uh, I'm going to turn to Habakkuk real quick. Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 2, I believe it is. So we read different versions. Yes, we study from the KJV. So please don't beat me in the comments. That being said, This Bible is a Matthew's Bible. You'll learn a little bit more about it next next study. Miles Coverdale, William Tyndale, John Rogers um, had to do with the, the Matthew's Bible. Eighty three over eighty three percent of it. Um of your KJB comes out of that Bible. So we study that one. Um, and we study a lot of other versions. But in this Habakkuk 3, verse 2, I'm going to read it real quick. I'm going to read you what the KJB says. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years in the midst of the years make known in wrath remember mercy doesn't tell me nothing doesn't tell me nothing about a donkey or a cow there are some other versions that you can read where it says revive thy work in the midst of the years in the, in the midst of the years make known. It says, revive, let me read it. Revive. Uh, I guess I didn't write it down. Anyway, I'm going to speak off the top of my head that I can remember. But it talks about uh, revive in the midst of two lives. There's another version that says in between two beasts. So um, when you get on down, there's a commentary that goes with it, um, with this study, and it talks about um, Isaiah 1 3, which we've already went over. Um, the ox knows its owner, and the. Uh, The ass knows his master's crib. That being said, 
that's how they got what the commentary that we were reading. They put two and two together with Isaiah, and they got that the Habakkuk three two basically was was talking about Jesus. Now, I'm not holding to that. You can think what you want. Um, it was interesting. Like I said, we studied cows and we studied donkeys, and that came up in the donkeys and the cows. So, don't beat me. Anyway, um, there's also a hymn. A hymn that speaks. It was written in 1876. It says, A child is born in Bethlehem. Exalt for joy, Jerusalem. With an exultant heart, let us adore the newborn Christ with a new song. The Son of God, the Father, in the highest has taken flesh. By an angel Gabriel announced, the virgin has conceived the Son. Like a bridegroom from the chamber, he proceeds from the womb of the mother. Lo, he who reigns above the skies, there, is, there in a manger lowly lies. The ox and the ass in neighboring stall see in that child the Lord of all. And the angel to the shepherds, the Lord reveals that he is risen. And kingly pilgrims, long foretold from east, bring incense, myrrh, and gold, and enter with their offerings to hail the newborn King of kings. He comes, a maiden's mother's son, yet earthly father has he none. From the serpents, poison free, he owned our blood and pedigree. Our feeble flesh and his the same, our sinless kinsman he became, that we from deadly thrall set free, like him and so like God, should be. Come then, and on his natal day, rejoice before the Lord and pray, and to the Holy One in three give praise and thanks eternally. So, that's one thing we found. And like I said, we kept running into the ox, and I, I couldn't figure it out. Couldn't figure out. Usually if something keeps hitting me, if I keep running into the same thing, it's God trying to speak to me. Yes, I test the spirits. So I'm trying to figure it out. Um, so we start studying ox. And... Uh, Michelle and I work out. We go to the gym. We run. Um, so I guess you could say we're we're athletic. We're in shape. Whatever. Um, one thing we've noticed. At the gym. And other places. Where people that we know have taken this. are getting very lean. They're losing a lot of weight. Their faces are sinking in. They look almost sickly. No, they do look sickly, not almost. Um, it's, it's unnatural. And we all know about it. We all know. And so I asked God, like, what's going on here? And so we get on this study about the donkeys and the cows. And then Genesis 4, or 41. I think it's Genesis 41.4. I'll go there real quick. You'll know it. Uh, I don't need to go there. Uh, I, it's Genesis 41. I'd, I'd almost, I'll bet dollars to donuts it's Genesis 41. You can look it. I'm sure you'll find it. It's Joseph and Pharaoh. And like I've hypothesized in here a thousand times, where do you live? What's on the back of your money? So, that's up to you. So who's Pharaoh? Anyway. Um, Joseph interpreted a dream from Pharaoh. 
where seven well-favored kine were on a shore. And then seven ill-favored and lean-fleshed kine came in and swallowed up the well-favored kine. Swallowed up. So, what are kine? Cows. They're cows. Y'all know what the Latin is. It's vaca. You know what C-I-N is. C-I-N-E. Medicine. Cow medicine. Don't muzzle the ox that treadeth out the grain. It's feeding it flesh. It's feeding its flesh. It, it does what it wants. It goes where it's where the master steers it, right? Its master steers it. The owners steer it because it wants to keep feeding that flesh. And so that's how they've done it throughout the years. Whenever they want humanity or society to go in a certain direction, I've said it in here, you've heard it a thousand times, the Hegelian dialect, they have this need. So they create this problem over here to get everybody mad. They wait for the reaction. Everybody get mad. Then they offer this as the solution and everybody just swallows all over it and takes it and goes. I posted on my community page a ad it had the former president in it, and he was saying final famine. Unfavorable kind, lean fleshed. You can see it for yourself. I mean, maybe you guys don't go to the gym, I don't know. Maybe, whatever, maybe you guys know people that have, that have done it. Look at them. Uh, maybe that's something you haven't noticed, I don't know. But the former president was sitting there saying final famine. He's doing another one. called blackout or something like that. I don't know. So anyway, um, it's fear-based mind control. They're steering everybody to go in a certain direction that they want them to go. So, says, uh, like I said earlier, don't, don't muzzle the ox that tread out the grain. It's feeding its flesh. I said earlier about feeding your spirit. That's what I want everybody to do. And uh, it's kind of hard to get people to do it. Like I said, look, this next video I got coming up is, is the Jeremiah video. I'm going to seem like Jeremiah. And uh, even people that I know that are rock solid Christians, they're. Uh, I don't know. You do have five foolish and you have five wise. I get beat by the five wise a lot. <laughs> it's hard for me to keep my mouth shut when I see something or when somebody asks me something. I'm blunt about it. Um, I mean, I try to sugarcoat things for the, mo for the most part. But... Uh, all these people that are going to these churches and celebrating Christmas and Easter and all this stuff. You're whoring yourself out. I did a video called The Church is a Whore. It's my first video. Um, it wasn't a real good one. Um, and it don't have very many views. And I, uh, it's a bad thing. But that's what it's going to seem like. I... Uh, I talk to people quite a bit. They go to church. People that, you know, are solid. But they still have one thing that they hold on to. And so, whenever they ask a question, or whenever something's happening, and I point this out, like, hey, Deuteronomy 28, we are creators of any prison that we are in. 
we create our own prison. When I was sticking a needle in my arm, when I was stealing from people, I went to prison. Prison I created. But even when I wasn't behind bars, 17 years I was a drug addict. 17 years. I was in prison for two. So, if you ask me, I would say I was in prison for 17, not just two. Because that needle, it's a prison too. Uh, adultery, keeping secrets, lies, trying to remember lies. All that stuff, it's a prison. If you got to get out and freeze in the middle of winter to go half a mile to buy yourself some cigarettes, like I said, I don't like giving people back. I don't like being Jeremiah. I had a pastor once. He called me uh, holier than thou. I'm not sinless. I've never claimed to be sinless. I can sin in my mind. I can get mad at somebody driving down the highway and that little evil spirit or whatever that follows me around everywhere that whispers something into my mind. I can take that thought that it puts there and I can manifest whatever I can off that feeling. For me, that's sin. If you consider it sin, that's fine. If not, that's fine. But we chastise ourselves. Um, and like I said, I'm not trying to be holier than anybody. I sin. I'm, I'm not without sin. So, we'll, uh, we'll go over that <laughs> in the next video. But, I mentioned something earlier about muzzling the ox. It's feeding the flesh. We need to feed our spirit. This is the only way to do it. I've said this on the video too before, um, but I'm going to go ahead and replay it. I'm going to go ahead and say it again. Let's go to John 6. I'm going to start. I'm going to start in... Verse 47... John 6 and verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Bread is meant to be eaten. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If man, any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. He did, didn't he? Rode into town. What did I saw it earlier? A triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Boy, he came in like a king, didn't he? Riding lowly on a donkey. Everybody out there in that street is expecting to see something else. They've been watching too many movies. They can't see it when it's right there in front of them. So he came in on that ass. Just like me. Don't think of Jerusalem just as a physical place. Don't think of Zion as a physical place. It is a physical place. I can, I can tell you where I believe it is, but you guys would think I'm crazy. Uh, I, think I've, I think I've actually said it here before. But anyway, that being said, think of Jerusalem, the city of peace, 
Jeru, city of shalom, peace. Think of that as a place. What did Crystal call it? The rooftops. Don't come down from your housetop. H 1406. Rooftops. Altar. Pray without ceasing. So, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. We go to 6, going down to 60. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? Me calling this what it is, and you not knowing what it is? Does this offend you? If you would have read, you would have known. Verse 62. What? And if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, it is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. Don't muzzle the ox. Look at all the work it's doing. And it, it, it's feeding itself. It, it thinks it's doing it, you know, just feeding itself. How many are fooled? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If they would have read, what did Jesus say? If you would have known in this day, this very day, and he looks over and he weeps. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Given to him of my Father. And you chose not to pick it up. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Hmm. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Disciples. I guess there goes that once saved, always saved. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. We believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'll go ahead and read the rest. And we believe that thou art sure art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot. We've talked about Iscariot before. Iscariot is Kerioth. Judas, K 
Kerioth means city. Judas of the city. The son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Now, I keep telling people about this. I'm sure all you keep telling people about it. We are that bride. We are those disciples that are not going anywhere. We have put we have put all our eggs in one basket. Why? Why have we put all our eggs in one basket? Verse 69. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. I've been accused at church when I was teaching fear monger I'm a fear monger that's what I was called some people can only be saved out of fear my Bible says so let me run to Jude Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference. And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now, I said all that in Jude to say this. I told you before I started that uh, there was another reason it took me a while to get back um, I kind of had a uh, <laughs> I kind of had a Jeremiah moment or Elijah moment sorry not Jeremiah Elijah so Elijah he called down fire, killed the prophets. And then what? The next day, Jezebel gets word to him that he's going to die. And he runs. <laughs> His greatest victory. And he runs from it. So here's my Elijah moment. About six weeks ago, I'm pulling out of my driveway. I get a call on the phone. I had a, a lady want to give me a bid, or had wanted me to come over and, and uh, give her a bid on a job. Um, some of you know, some of you don't know. I uh, work at a steel mill. I work at a steel mill anywhere from 4 o'clock in the morning until 2 o'clock, or from 6 o'clock until 2 o'clock at the steel mill. When I get off, I go, um, I have a business of my own. I do. I cut trees, I cut grass, I do small construction business, kind of like a, hi a handyman. And that's why, uh, <laughs> that's why Sally and Karen's always getting on me and my wife, my wife especially. <laughs> she uh, very busy. Um, I work from sun up, and sometimes I don't get down, get done to, till sundown. So I'm looking anywhere from you know 14 to 16 hour days sometimes. And uh, so that's kept me really busy. But that being said, I got a call as I'm driving out of the driveway. So I answer it. I stop. I answer it. And uh, I said, yeah, I said, I'm about a mile and a half from you. I'll be right there. I pull out of my driveway and I get down to the stop sign. I make a left onto a busy street. It's a four-lane busy street. Speed limit's about 40 miles an hour. A car, a truck, a three-quarter ton pickup truck turns right beside me, and he starts speeding up. And he just kind of leaves me in the dust. 
And uh, so I'm driving, and I can see him up ahead. And there's a big line of cars I'm coming up to because there's a car way ahead trying to turn left. And so all these oncoming, you know, all the oncoming traffic on the other side has got a whole line of cars stopped, and this car can't turn left. So I'm coming up behind the line of cars, and I see the man that passed me. He's probably going anywhere from 45 to 55 miles an hour in this 40 mile an hour zone. And I see a flash. And I see this gold pickup, three quarter ton. It nose dives into the ground. And the back of it came up so high, I could have run my truck right up underneath it. And it could have set on my, on my hood. So I get over in that lane, I stop. And I get out, and I go to check on the people in the truck. Uh, on the other side, there was a little SUV that had turned in front of us, or turned in front of the, the truck. And he hit it. He hit it probably, like I said, uh, probably about 45 to 55 miles an hour in between there. So anyway, I'm trying to knock on the truck, and I can't. They, they're, they're fine in there, but they won't roll down the window, or they can't roll down the window, I'm not sure. I look over as I'm running up to the truck to begin with, and there's a girl in there. She's probably 15 years old. She's talking on her phone. So she's probably talking on her phone um, whenever it happened. But that being said, when the guy was coming up, there was a, there was a line of cars blocking her sight, so she couldn't have seen him coming up anyway. So it's just kind of like a... A no fault accident but anyway she's about 15 years old and she's hysterical on the phone I can't see through the windows because they're tinted of this truck so I can't see these people to know if they're okay I can see that she's okay so I'm knocking on the door knocking on the door knocking on the window and I can see people going like this and holding their hands up but I don't, but I can see them both moving they're fine and so the girl Starts screaming. She starts screaming. So I look over, and she's she's looked back. She's kind of looking back down inside the SUV in the passenger where the passenger seat would be. And she's screaming. So I'm. I think God, there's got to be somebody else in the car. Sorry. So anyway, I run over there, and I look in, and I look at the girl screaming, and I said, "Honey, I said I'm going to need you to get out of that car, so I can get in." So she gets out. Kids these days. This girl's 15 years old. She ain't got hardly a stitch of clothes on. She's got like a bikini top and shorts that leaves nothing to the imagination. She gets out. And I get in. There's a girl in there. She's probably anywhere between 13 to 15 years old. She might be 70 pounds sopped in motor oil. She's got different colored hair down the top. She's got white hair over here and red hair over here. She's got facial piercings everywhere. She has Wicca tattoos from head to toe. And all this stuff is running through my mind as I'm seeing this child. I first thought, I said, oh honey, what has Satan done to you? Meaning the tattoos and everything. You know, it's like, because I know, and, and I'm going to tell you something. I have a, a playlist on my on my on my page. There's a playlist. It's called Darby. It's a, it's a pastor from uh, Kentucky. He's got a he's got a sermon on down about witches. It's called Witches, Root Workers, and Herbalists, and it talks about tattoos and piercings and how every tattoo and every piercing has a spirit attached to it. That's why when the demoniac of Gadarene, whenever he went. To, What's your name? Legion. For 
we are many. You've got to understand that every time you grab one of Satan's toys, each toy has something attached to it. And it gives you it gives Satan full access to you. So anyway. I look at her and I'm like, oh God, honey, what has Satan done to you? And I'm wondering how a kid this age has this many tattoos. You can't get tattoos unless you're 18 or 21 in this state. Parents. Parents. So... She's looking down, and her eyes are open, and she's got blood coming out everywhere. She ain't moving. Her friend was screaming at her lifeless body. So. I get this thing and it hits me. And it says, Speak. I have the gift of tongues, I pray in spirit. There's been a few of you that might have heard me talk in the spirit underneath my breath. But whatever it is hit me. And I could feel it. And it was power. And it said, Speak. telling you everything in me this girl's dead she ain't moving her eyes are open lifeless eyes so this tells me to speak and I just remember just the floodgates start going out I'd reach down and I grabbed her head so I could see her and I had her head up against the had her head up against the headrest and I just started and it wasn't five to ten seconds it was maybe even less than that and this girl just starts I mean she comes back to she's breathing and choking and hacking on all this stuff when she come back to Whatever I had felt, all that whatever was gone. And I told I told my wife, I said it was just like when whenever God turned around, whenever the lady with the issue of blood had touched him. And he turned around and he asked, Who had touched me? Because he felt virtue leave him. And they said, Master, you're, you're thronged on every side. And you ask who touched you? He said, I perceive somebody's touched me because virtue has left me. And he looks at her and he says, you're healed. Anyway, she comes back too. She starts asking me to get her out and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I'm sitting here trying to keep her, keep her calm. You know, the police get there. They're doing stuff with the perimeter and all this and that. They leave me in the car. I'm trying to, she can't breathe. I'm, uh, the police officer comes over with a knife and we cut the, uh, the airbag out because she's got airbags all around her and she looks like she's in a tent. And uh, so anyway, we, we get that all going. And I asked her, I said, honey, what is your name? She said, Hope. I said, Hope, huh? I said, I'm Joshua. I said, that's a beautiful name, Hope. So I talked to her until the paramedics took her out. And uh, I went over and I gave the, the other girl a hug. We were there for an hour probably. 
I prayed for her. And then I went. <coughs> I got back in my truck. And I just started it up. And that lady had called about uh, the uh, estimate. <laughs> and I told her, I said, I'm sorry. I said, this is what happened. I said, I'm a, I'm a few blocks away from your house. I said, I'll be right there. She said, okay. I got out. I got out of her my truck at her house. And I mean, <laughs> this poor lady, she's, she's in her late 70s, early 80s. And uh, I'm bawling. I'm I'm bawling like a three-year-old little girl with a skin knee. And uh, she looked at me and talked to me just like I talked to that girl. She said, honey, she said, just have a seat. And so we sat down. And I got to pour out for 15 minutes <laughs> all this stuff that had happened in the last hour. And it was weird because I went over everything and I got up to leave whenever it was time to leave. And uh, I asked God, I said, God, what are you trying to tell me? Because I know something. It's I look for God in everything. I pray without ceasing. I'm always looking for God in something because God's always speaking to me. And I said, God, I know you're trying to tell me something with this girl's name, with this hope. Does this mean we don't have any hope? Does this mean all hope's lost? I seen the girl go off in a in an ambulance. I said, or does this mean that there is hope because she lived? Or at least I think she lived. What does this mean? And about that time this biggest cloud of white noise came in and just settled over me. My ears started ringing real loud. And it was like, the only thing I can, I told my wife, it's the only thing I can attribute it to, it was like when Daniel uh, had made his prayer, and then the angel came to tell him, and the prince of Persia withstood the angel. And so the angel's trying to fight down there and get down to him, and finally uh, Michael has to come and help him. That's the only thing I can attribute it to. That's what it felt like. It felt like a whole bunch of white noise, like a whole bunch of distortion just came over me, like a big veil. And it's been sitting there. And it's been like that. It was like that for probably two or three weeks. So there's been that, and then it, it kind of... It kind of wore on me. It kind of wore on me for a while when you see something like that. So it made me think of Elijah as well. You know how he had that moment. I, I did not heal this girl. I did not bring this girl back. I felt something. I felt something enter me and I felt it leave. So I know it wasn't me. So I can't take any any credit. But it's funny how God works. About three weeks ago, I take a guy home from work every day. <laughs> I dropped him off and I went around the block and I was pulling out and there's a blind corner. There's a stop sign and a blind corner. So I stop behind the stop sign and then, after I stop, I roll out in the street, and I look, and there's a car coming, but I can get out in front of it. So I just keep on going. <laughs> so anyway, it ends up being a police officer. <laughs> and he thought I'd run that stop sign. <laughs> so he pulled me over. And it just so happened to be that same cop that took my uh, statement and did everything there on the scene. I said, man, I said, did she live? And he said, yeah, she lived. He couldn't give me any information because the girl's uh, the girl's underage, you know, so couldn't give her out anything. I don't know how to get a hold of her. But uh, she lived. I just pray that God hope that God gets through her somehow. She was invited to a wedding that day. 
just like Gary's accident. I told everybody in here. I told, I told Gary that the story, the parable of the wedding. Went out to the highways and byways. God invited her to the wedding on that day. I hope she answers. Anyway, uh, the donkey and the ox. The ox, they always follow each other at chow time. You always see them in the line going across pastures. Don't be an ox. You don't need no medicine. Feed your spirit. And look for Jesus between the pages. And you'll find him in multiple places on each page. It's an onion. I love you guys. We'll see you back here next time. God bless.